Welcome to an incredibly special episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I would love to introduce you to my friend of 20 years and a hero of mine, Mr. Pete Flint. Pete is the founding CEO of Trulia, which went from a startup in a Stanford uh, house to a $3.5 billion exit and went public on the way. Um, Pete leading the whole adventure through. So I'd love to hear the lessons learned from that experience. And then on top of it, Pete we're now wears the other hat. He run, he founded and runs one of the uh, e the largest uh, pre-seed and seed dedicated fund, NFX, which is the expert in all things network effects. Pete, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Alex. So great to be here. Uh, good to see you again and like, uh, and chat about stuff. Well, great. This is this is actually for our audience. This is really helpful. To imagine you're having uh, conversations with friends uh, that are just having, and Pete is going to tell tell the whole story, the unvarnished truth behind the what it takes to take a company from a super early, you know, foundational stage where you just have an idea, all the way to an IPO and then subsequent, you know, exit. Um, to build the, you know, what is today the online uh, real estate industry as we know it. So Pete, you know, if we look at that journey and let's say there's three phases that we would want to cover, right? Like some, like one is very early stages when you're just figuring out how to talk to investors, how to, you know, build your team. We want to dig into the challenges around that. We want to, you know, you, you lived through 2008, a crash in real estate uh, clearly affected your business. So we want to hear what, what were the challenges like that along the journey. And then the thought process around, you know, how do you uh, take, to, you know, how do you exit, right, from both the IPO and then a really successful business that you, you've built and then move on to new adventures. So let's dive in. Sure, a lot, a lot to cover. Um, yeah, uh, and that's that's before we even get to the network <laughs> effects, <laughs> right? But you have, you know, now that you're a VC, kind of, let's take another look at the, those founding moments, right? And what what were some of the tips that you would offer to founders wearing your shoes, you know, back yeah. in uh, 2005, six times time frame? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, just, I mean, we connected as as um, fellow students at Stanford. I, you know, my my story is I came, I worked in internet businesses in Europe, and then moved to Silicon Valley. And um, um, and um, I, uh, you know, one of the tasks I had to do, like many people, was to find somewhere to live. And I had these sort of like big ideas about Silicon Valley. It's like you know, there's going to be like um, amazing technologies, amazing services. It was the home of Apple and. Google and all these things and you know and I was um trying to find somewhere to live and I was like what and it was god awful it's like um terrible um you know it's sort of you know to find information there was Craigslist or we had to speak to a um a realtor and um you know and I I think the you know one of the remarkable things about Silicon Valley is just it's a problem solving culture when you see a problem mm. you kind of like don't grumble about it you mm -hmm. kind of like get on and okay, how can I fix that? So I spent a lot of time just thinking about how to kind of like fix that and solve that. And I think the, you know, perhaps one of the lessons for me at the time was naivety was very much an asset versus a um a weakness. And I think you see a lot of ideas in in companies, not not um ideas for transformative companies, not coming from the core of the industry, but coming from the the periphery. Um, what are the intersection between um, different industries? And so I, you know, I was very sort of naive. I didn't even know where Milwaukee is. Probably still mm. don't, you know, like um, about, you know, I didn't know anything about US geography, let alone kind of US real estate. Um, but I really felt that this was a big, meaningful problem that I was was um, was really interested in solving. So, um, you know, as you know, teamed up with a, a classmate, Sammy, um and um and really thought about um what was you know how how do you solve this problem how do you solve the supply side and how do you solve the demand side so you know there's there's a couple of chapters to the story but 
you know, I guess I said we we launched in 2005, um, a kind of small prototype service. Um, and then, you know, we that and then really the the kind of goal was to find product market fit pretty early on. I think probably we, you know, people like looking for houses and looking at pictures. And I think we probably hit product market fit pretty early on, but with a really, I would say, sort of jankyish product and kind of really sort of prototype MVP. So you hit it and you think the the reason it was successful is one, it's sort of this visual experience. People like to just just look at pictures, um, you know, at, at, and but separately, I, like I'm really intrigued, your own insight, you know, you're you're come from a culture where, you know, talking to salespeople is not seen as a delightful type of uh, experience. So like when you say talking to realtors, you know, that was sort of you didn't want to go, you know, call up realtors. Right. Like and it sounds like you had an, a, an empathy that the world is moving to that direction and people don't want to talk to salespeople. They want to kind of self-serve themselves and have yeah. the freedom to discover and, you know, and make buying decisions or at least, you know, yeah. educate themselves on the future buying decisions as much independently. Is that kind of the, what was going yeah, on I there? I mean, the early, the early sort of competitive positioning was that we were absolutely focused on providing the best data and mm -hmm. insights to help consumers with primarily the home buying, but that we kind of moved into home selling and rentals, mm -hmm. but all the data essentially um, and insights to help them with that decision. And then the other axis was how do we create the very best user experience around that? So design driven, um, easy to use. And so if you, you know, the two by two where we're like, okay, you know, and we were competing against like newspapers, Mm -hmm. Real estate agent websites, um, MLSs, all had their kind of various different constraints, and they, you know, really inhibiting them to execute on that. But ultimately, <clears throat> we know that you know the truth in two thousand five, as in the truth in twenty twenty four, is that ease of use and data uh, and insights are kind of paramount in these high decision decision process. So, kind of how that manifests itself is. You know, on the on the consumer side, like how do we get as much information there? So, you know, obviously, you know, historical prices, valuations, crime data, all these sort of things that, you know, your real estate agent wouldn't necessarily tell you, but you kind of want to know. And then the other piece was, at the time, um, this seems sort of, um, you know, bizarre now, but you know, mapping was just breaking through. You know, right. sort of like Google Maps launched three months before us. We kind of used their API to kind of build our map interface. The, you know, broadband internet was just starting to become pervasive. And so people could download pictures. A lot of the previous right. generation services were very sort of two-dimensional text heavy. And yeah. We're like, okay, we're going to all map and, um, you know, map on every page and rich images. And consumers love that. Yeah. And so this is really interesting parallel i actually heard you describe the sort of like one dimensional interface in in the kind of like of was without the maps right like sort of a flat flat experience and it's and i think you're you have this juxtaposition like here we are in silicon valley you know the world is changing but you know some of the largest transactions that a consumer could have in their lifetime are being you know presented in the suboptimal yeah. way that reduces the likelihood of that transaction happening right it's sort of that f feels like you've you've nailed that and as you were figuring out that product solution like you were like the product manager effectively and then you start you know fundraising right and you know what advice would you give to yourself now that you've been on the other side of the table Right, as a as a kind of somebody who invests in a ton of ton of companies, what did you do right? What would you do different if you were fundraising again for your next startup? Yeah. Um, so we were, you know, I think. <clears throat> I mean, firstly, I moved to the US and didn't really know anyone, um, and so you know, but I did. I was um, 
like you, a student at Stanford. And so I kind of, that was the network that I had. And so really, it was really about kind of networking my way um, kind of through to that. I, you know, the, the, I think there was a, probably a couple of things that we did um, rightly and wrongly. Like, you know, that I guess the two big mistakes we made fundraising <clears throat> was, <that, clears throat> excuse me, you can imagine, a, you know, the technology platform we build, there's a front end and the back end. <clears throat> and we um we spend a lot of energy building the back end, which is really the hard thing, um, which is like aggregating enormous amounts of data, which sort of right. changes on a rapid basis. Because because um, because because you're basically like an Oxford physics student right back in the days, and and uh, and Sami is also a fellow rocket scientist, and so you guys <laughs> cared about the substance. Yeah, you want to. I mean, that's that felt like the hard thing to yeah, kind of yeah. put the data together. I mean, I'm a, you know, I, I think of myself more as a sort of like product guy and yeah. a growth guy than a than a necessarily a kind of like an engineer. Um, mm -hmm. But you you care about you know these people making poor decisions. You care about the data integrity. So we're like, okay, let's get all the data integrity right. Um, and then I had a sort of a an idea for what the front end would be like. But you know, and we were sketching that. But we just like, you know, we we um. We kind of like um, thought, well, we'll, add, we'll slap that on at the end. We kind of know what is. But if the data is not right, then it doesn't really matter. Um, and I remember going to kind of pitch um, Sequoia and Excel and like with this prototype. Said, Look, it works. The data is awesome. It's like, you know, and we've got all this data from these disparate sources. And, and we had it on a kind of like a terrible user interface. And they said, like, you know, good luck. But um, you know, we need to see the kind of like um, make it make it look great if you're trying to build a big consumer business. And so, um, you know, as it happened, we kind of ended up um, adding on the user interface and then going back to them. Um, you know, AXO invested like three months after we launched, and then Sequoia two years after. But it, you know, they they came around ultimately. But um, you know, the mistake was just to be like, well, what is what is the belief from investors is that data is a relatively solvable problem. Um, mm. Whereas the interface requires a certain level of kind of magic and expertise to be able to build in that interface. And I think that, you know, particularly in the consumer business, you know, I, they thought the consumer interface was the hard thing, the data was the thing, and I thought the opposite, you know, but I think I didn't put myself in the mind of the investor um, at that time to understand what would be the critical piece. Because they, you know, the belief is that if you can get demand, then the supply will follow. And this is one of these marketplaces where absolutely that's the case. You get demand and then supply will follow. The other, the other mistake we made was to, um, you know, we, we focused, you know, initially on spending a lot of time with kind of like, perhaps I would say kind of bigger name VCs. Um, mm. with their sweet spot is leading Series A's. Um, and yet we were kind of at this pre-launch prototype stage and so i think those meetings in some ways were kind of helpful to kind of socialize the idea but none of them led to fundraising conversations we kind of met them all because i think we were we were like okay they no, were knocking on our door we wanted the best investors but they were just not the right investors for us and so we ended up getting um you know essentially a bunch of kind of angels and micro funds um to kind of pull together the the seed round and that you know and then that converted it. That was the right milestone for the kind of what you call probably pre-seed today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and then move into kind of like um, season series A. Got it. And and what, like, obviously it worked out and you got some of the best investors in the business on board. So what do you think was the magic that helped you self-select was those types of investors Um in you know what what kind of made them overcome whatever whatever challenges you had it whether in terms of presentation or other areas um i think you know it's, it, it was a hard sell at the time because there are literally no successful uh you know now there's a category called prop tech and like you know there were literally zero um successful prop tech companies or real estate companies it is a category it had not been um, successful. Um, you know, I'd probably say, you know, 
probably a couple of things. You know, one, we were really efficient um, mm. as, a, as a company. You know, ultimately, we went public having raised $33 million. Um, and right, let's just repeat this for the sake of our audience. You went public was $33 million. Yeah, we have kind of companies that are raising $33 million. They don't know what the heck they're doing <laughs> and just put a bunch of like bios yeah. on board and just slap AI on top of it and yeah. say, we're doing that, right? $33 million to go public. And what was yeah. the, uh, uh, what do you remember? I know you exited 3.5 billion. What was the um, IPO market cap? It was around 500 million. That was a sort of... Um, Kind of, so it was like you know in those a, days that's very respectable yeah, uh absolutely you know, yeah. it, it was a it was a small um small ipo in 2012 yeah. we raised 100 million yeah. and um you know around the 500 million you know, amazing and so just being really efficient and you know we thought literally of the land like every dollar we got was going to be the last dollar and that's not um just because, you know, that's a combination of like really thinking about how does the product drive growth, you know, both on the supply and demand side, but also about um, it was it was the necessity. The necessity. Were, I think yeah. we're like, we could have, we, you know, a real estate company in 2008 was just the sort of like um, worst possible industry to, to be in. Well, let's, so, let's dive into that, right? Because so you've, you've raised a bit, you had momentum, where you had uh, larger real estate firms accounting for majority of your revenue, and then 2008 hits, those large real estate groups of uh, brands that we all know, they said, uh, hey, times are tough. And you had to rebalance your model to getting you know much larger number of customers but a smaller revenue per customer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that must have been a tough tough kind of uh moment for you know re rebalancing you already had some momentum you know the yeah. the 2000 you know obviously the market's crashing yours in particular so uh, like let's kind of put put an entrepreneur or anybody who's in the midst of a crisis right now let's put them into your mindset and what made you succeed and kind of power through that you know all around challenge which you know is not absolutely non-trivial and I and you know, and I think to quote one of your previous um from part one of your previous conversations that really struck me, you were despite all that challenge, you were still playing to win. You were not going on defense and kind of completely kind of cuddling up inside whatever you're doing. You went actually after the market despite yeah. all those challenges, which is fascinating to hear. Yeah, so so specifically we were in you know 2008 depth of the global financial crisis, you know, and we were in the eye of the storm because online real, you know, is basically the GFC was precipitated by the mortgage-backed securities, which, you know, resulted in massive increases, decreases in home sales and home values. And so um, we were, had some cash, we'd raised kind of, we kind of raised just before the kind of collapse. So we were kind of like fortunate in that, but we were, losing a lot of money very quickly and there was no hope of fundraising so like so so we were in this sort of like, okay we need to get break even um and the what we'd seen is that as a small company we were had its thirst for revenue we went kind of like enterprise sales we were going after big customers six-figure contracts you know and they were like cancelled all their deals um pretty much when the sort of like gfc happened Mm. Um, and, but what, what kind of happened in a funny sort of way was that we had, um, and it is how it happened. Like our head of customer service and, you know, we, we had to look all hands. This is kind of like, we're in an okay situation. It's not about going bankrupt, but we're like, um, we just need to make revenue. And, and, and people were kind of, the company was on sort of high alert. How to, how do we make revenue? And a head of like customer services was fielding kind of inbound calls from real estate agents who were saying and we didn't have any real estate agent product but they're saying look my listing on this page is like um is not is suboptimal not somehow, it's like right, yeah. okay the pictures are not right can you move the kind of kitchen picture to the front and all these sort of things and like and um 
And Robin was like, started like, why don't we try and sell them some stuff as well? Um, and um, and so like, you know, and she said, oh, you really, you really care about a product. Um, would you be interested in perhaps getting some more promotion um, for your listings and yourself? And um, and it was like a remarkable, and, and it was a good value package. And, you know, the agents were traditionally spending on newspapers at the time. And so we could offer something like very attractive to them from a price point. And the conversion rate, I forget what it was, but like something like 20% conversion rate of these sort of inbound calls for people who are complaining about things. So these um, are inbound. So, and then did you start, did you start moving from inbound to outbound? Exactly. Offering? So we okay. like, so we built it. So the customer service team, a sort of portion carved off, became inside sales, um, you know, which were initially reacted to inbound. And then, you know, we started putting promotions on the site and then really thinking about, okay, what is really thinking about what are the sort of personas of these agents that would be like perfect candidates for this kind of product, mining our data, prioritizing them, reach, and a whole bunch of kind of like um, um, lead uh, management um, and kind of um, um, prioritization initiatives we built out internally and improving the product. So that, so we scaled from this sort of like, you know, um, Aaron team, which was going off and trying to like, you know, scale revenue into, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people who are, who are uh, building the insert sales team. And so um, it was, you know, it was kind of um, a sort of enterprising culture who kind of figured out this, um, this way to sell. And I, I think probably I was probably quite resistant about having like large inside sales team at the time I wanted to like an efficient capital making machine that people would come in and self-service and like, but actually when you're dealing with local kind of SMBs, the inside sales. They needed the touch. They needed the they touch. Needed the touch. Yeah, yeah. And it was still a new enough thing. And real estate, it was one of those high touch, you know, relationship driven industries, yeah. right? So people want interesting. I think that, so, you know, that the practitioners are, we just at the time, we're just not used to kind of online, yeah, online sure. um, advertising and marketing. And so that was the, you know, that scaled incredibly efficiently. Um, and then, and the other, <clears throat> the other thing you mentioned is like, you know, um, don't play to lose, play to win. Right. Um, you know, I started my career in online travel in, <clears throat> excuse me, I started my career in online travel in, um, and I had a sort of like a somewhat similar experience in online travel in 2001 with um, a company called lastminute.com where we, were, we had a big online travel business, a travel marketplace. And then in, you know, September 11th happened. And, um, you know, in, in retrospect, it was the best time to be building that company. Um, it didn't feel like at the time for sure, but when you look back, you know, you know, Expedia, to some extent, um, Booking.com and the other online travel, but certainly last minute at the time in Europe, got massive market share games. They got, you know, really increased their, their market share. And, you know, you look at the business in 2008, it's like, okay, online real estate people, you know, I, I can, you know, one thing I know for true, in 10 years time, People are absolutely going to be buying and selling houses and living in houses, whatever happens to the economy. And they're absolutely going to be using digital platforms to do that. And so like, and so it was like, this was the time to attack, you know, not, not in a, in a sort of like, um, uh, throw your money at the wall and hope exactly, it, like, kind of like some uh, spaghetti sticks. Way, but right? like, yeah. You know, I think it's a sort of, and we see this now in a lot of companies It's like, okay, and there's been the process for many of them over the last couple of years. It's been okay. Let's assess. Let's change because there's certain things that you know that um, uh, don't work anymore, or you don't have the capital to do them. And then there's one group of founders which are like okay, let's hibernate until the world gets better. And there's another group which is like let's attack. Let's um let's play to win. Um, and I think it's you know they're. Uh, you know, not every company can attack, but actually, I think most companies can in their own way. 
And I, like, if, if we like, let's pinpoint into this because, you know, I could sort of connect on my own journey that if you're attacking, but you don't have your foundational stuff together, right? You could kind of waste a lot of resources because you're attacking, you may not be attacking the wrong area. You may be going frontal attack where you need to have a, a side attack. Or if you, even if you gain through, you don't have economics that are that attractive, you know, from the, that result from that attack. And so, you, you know, there's been a lot of these businesses that are spending $10 in attack to get, you know, $5 of revenue. And so that is a problem. And so how do you distinguish, you know, are you ready to attack? Right. And then the, the maybe the mode in this, particularly in this environment where, you know, fundraising it's more challenging unless you're a gen AI business, but even that where right, you probably sophisticated folks like you could see through the bullshit, you know, of what's real and what's not. So guide us a little bit on you know, when you're saying that, like, when do you know that, that, it, that it, this is the time to land grab, right? When are you yeah. ready for that? Is, is it really every business or do you need to reach certain basics before you well, go into that? Yeah. Function? I mean, it's, it was, I guess, you know, from that specific experience, it's, um, you know, we saw pretty clear product market fit um, in the sense the customers were enjoyed the product and they saw a lot of value in it. And um, this yeah. is on the kind of the B2B side. Um, and we tuned the product to kind of match the market. And we had, you know, you know, very good sort of traditional SaaS type metrics, whether that's you know, CAC LTV ratios, um, very efficient sales opportunities. And and so, and, and then the last thing is that we would, we could see that there was strong network effect opportunities right. in this. Um, and so when you see, you know, in, in, you know, we've seen over the last kind of like five years or so, there are certain industries where the customers may be fairly cheap today, but there's no sort of real benefit of scale, like selling mattresses online. It's like, you know, in most cases, it's like, sure, you might be making money, but you're... Um, How many no mattresses do you buy per year? And, yeah. Uh, and and talk no about... Kind of, there's no sort of necessarily like, a, you know, network effect such that sort of catch, no. capturing a significant number amount of the supply and demand really drives the um, uh, sort of defensibility of the of the, the business, but we could see, okay, there's clear network effects, really attractive unique economics. Now's the time to go. And um and uh you know and we you know that and that was really our um path to kind of attack the business to get to break even at that time as opposed to like okay let's like wait till things get a little better. Like no because there's someone else that can come along and somebody else and and sort of so again if I summarize it Disruption means people are more willing to change behaviors because it's a disruption for everybody. So customers are more willing to change. Yeah. And then you're coming in with a product that works and delivers values both to consumer and the business user. You have the economics that work for the business and you have the, the gold prize that you see, which is the network effects, which is really unique to your two-sided type of uh, yeah. marketplace business. So I, I think that's kind of a, a pretty powerful combo. You may not need to have all, you know, four out of, uh, you know, four out of four. You may need to have three out of four right in there. But it sounds like that combo was a great, great game changing move for you. And, you know, you had the boldness and the vision to play to play aggressively in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I and really built on a foundation Mm -hmm. of um teamwork frugality efficiency um and just a strong kind of people driven culture so i think that's you know i think organizational transitions are really hard um and if you have that right foundation from the people side of things at the beginning they are so much easier um we, we saw we've seen a number of companies the last couple of years and then back in that crisis where they were you know, very driven by kind of short-term financial incentives or um, or status symbols like unicorn right. Um, right. companies, which, um, you know, generally they're kind of hollow as opposed to um, more mission-driven companies. 
and strong teamwork driven cultures, which, you know, that foundation, if you don't have that foundation, then a lot of this stuff just doesn't happen. This is great because actually it leads me to my like next question. So let's fast forward. So you went public, you're CEO of a public company, you're doing well. You, you have a, you know, core competitor, you're kind of really going head to head. You've built this amazing culture. And I kind of, uh, I, to, you know, the, some people say that, right. I remember from the very early days of Trulia, you guys had your value, value, um, you know, me uh, mem, mem like uh, statement. And it was sort of really, so people could remember it. So you guys really were living that. So you have this great company, you're performing well, you're public, and then you have to make a decision as a CEO, like what, like how to think about the exit, you know, what to accept. Um, guide us a little bit through that journey, and you know, maybe those those that are thinking about, you know, how to yeah. make that decision on behalf of the shareholders and on behalf of the business. You know, how, yeah, we what were, were some thought process? <clears throat> yeah, we we were. You know, the company was, I don't know, somewhere kind of two plus billion dollars. Um, uh, we were, so this was sort of 2014, mm -hmm. a couple, you know, a couple of years post IPO. Um, you know, we were revenue run rate, quarter of a billion dollars, um, you know, a thousand plus people and things were going great, I would say. You know, there's always things to fix, but generally we were kind of, we we're very happy with where things were going. And then, you know, we got a, um, an inbound essentially from, from Zillow. Mm -hmm. And so Zillow is a sort of near competitor. Um, we, we started in quite different places sort of Zillow started over there, over here with home values and um, Zestima and really built a great brand from that. And then Trulia started over here with homes to sell. And searching and information around that, and then over the sort of like subsequent, you know, uh, eight eight plus years, the propositions have kind of merged. You know, what we had two and, smart teams. You're figuring out the market. Yeah, and it's sort of like uh, you want to be total solution yeah. to to the it's market. Sort of, you know, people had sort of you know the people had different preferences, um, but generally, it kind of like it was sort of the you know, these two similar, but very similar business models. Um, and I think in, in many ways that competition was really helpful because it's helped to kind of bring a lot of the, it helped to kind of change the mindset of the real estate agents and brokers that they need to embrace digital marketing and they need to embrace kind of listing syndication and that, you know, and it was sort of the collective kind of brain power, these two teams competing very aggressively was, was the path forward. Anyway, we got this kind of inbound, um, and we weren't certainly weren't looking to sell, but the, you know, I think at the time, um, you know, you could sort of go through things as sort of bunch of soul, soul searching and think, okay, what is the right path for the company? You know, I had the best job I could imagine, mm -hmm. um, but you, you know, I, I sort of came to a kind of like, sort of. Um, perspective that and this is somewhat kind of like retrospective in terms of how I think about it but you know the advice I would give folks in in a similar position was that you know it it can make sense to sell if a, a number of these sort of criteria are, are in place so one was we were the number two to Zillow in terms of number uh, in terms of market position in terms of Zillow which was number one um you know Zillow was um a quarter or two ahead of us and they'd raised three times the amount of money that we had and so we were just this little bit behind um and i think in in clear and network effect businesses if you are that little bit behind um without significant differentiation it's really hard to catch up and i'm not quite sure that we had sort of all the ideas um or the, i mean the, re the resources essentially to get there uh, mm. to make them you need a really significant um uh technology or market catalyst to kind of to, to change that market position um two is that the you know we were very much a product driven company we were like focused on significant growth using the product we were just engineers 
by heart. Okay, how do we, if we wanted to solve a problem, we design a, um, a product to solve that. And the product differentiation kind of being sort of whittled away. Um, what we had, they had, and vice versa, and actually turned into more of a marketing battle. So, you know, collectively, we're spending so like 150 million a year on marketing. I right. mean, that's TV ads, it's all of it, um, online advertising. Um, and so the kind of the rules of the game had changed, you know. And Right. So what got you to your original success and your passion for product led and getting all that best data and everything, uh, you know, fixing the UX, that was no longer going to be the, the game changer in the competition. Yeah. And what is going to be is basically kind of classical marketing spend yeah. in the CMO game. Uh, we could do that, but it just wasn't that fun. And yeah. it's like, and I don't know, you necessarily create that much value um, doing it as well, because, it, you know, the value kind of accrues to, um, you know, the TV. Google, Google <laughs> TV <laughs> and Facebook. Um, <laughs> and I guess three is like, does this, is this kind of like fair value for future execution? You know, and I think it kind of felt, um, you know, reasonable um you know it's at, at that kind of like multiple based on the revenue so it, it seemed kind of reasonable um so kind of that you know that was you know that was the kind of feeling so it was a stock for stock merger between the two companies and i you know wasn't i wasn't looking to move but it kind of like okay this was the right move for the for their shareholders and employees and ultimately it could bring the the product roadmap which was um, you know, both companies are roughly similar view on the product roadmap. You could bring that forward a couple of years by combining right. resources and and create a, a lot of value. So I, you know, I was, um, you know, I was on the Zillow board for a while, but otherwise I was kind of trying to think about what's next. Well, let's talk about that. So the transition from founder ceo of trulia to an investor at nfx must have been quite this journey and i i think it would be really helpful to hear what your experience as a founder influence you know how it influenced your approach to building nfx which is you know in my view definitely feels like it's built by a founder because you're effectively building in you know in terms of products right like you're you have a bunch of solutions that you've built i you know i think a lot of folks use for example nfx signal to connect with other investors so you're you've taken a really radically different approach to investment um fund uh yeah. and you know i kind of wanted to see how you connect the dots but to me it feels like here's pete doing his uh you know you know, founder ahead on, but like rethinking what a fund should look like. Uh, yeah, that, know, I mean, that would, future. you know, we, we wanted to put a fund at the earliest stage that we wanted to have when we were founders. Um, and so, and we always felt that the, you know, in my, my, um, the founding general partners are James Curry and Gigi Levi Weiss. And, you know, we were all similar background as investors, operators, and founders. And, um, you know, the best advice um, came from other operators when we were, or former founder, or founders, when we were operating, the single best advice. And so, like, if you could, if you're a founder and you can sign yourself with other founders that also kind of can um, uh, can invest in the, in the company, then that's the best of both worlds. And so that was very much the focus to be a, um, a team that have, um, being there and have that empathy through many different periods. And the other piece is, of, you know, as, as operators, when we see a problem, we think about how, what's the technology solution to this? Mm. And so much of kind of BC is sort of old world judgment, you know, not driven by kind of data. They're not, they're not kind of like practicing what they preach, um, no. you know, which is like if, you, if you're, a, if you're a, you know, founder, you use data, you use technology, you use high scalability, you use like, Kind of what is the sort of edge you have, and so we really thought about NFX as a company, and so uh, you know our, our um, product team, a software team, and and it's an, our AI team essentially is kind of on par with our, if not bigger than our investment, investment team. Um, 
So they've really, and they've really embraced a lot of, you know, AI technologies, um, and we, which we think, um, you know, don't necessarily help in the picking, but give us kind of a, a real kind of opportunity to think about how do we aggregate data and, and platform and be most helpful to the, um, be most efficient ourselves to analyze the vast surface area of, of, of deals out there. Well, let's let's dig into your focus, right, and your core area of expertise, which is network effects. And I guess the one observation that I have is that even if you were an operator, but you operated five years ago, ten years ago, you may not be operating um, in the the current environment, right? You may not be up to up to speed and up to the latest trends, right? Certainly, some things like culture and team building those remain the same. But even now, in the remote first environment, those change a little bit. But with network effects, you guys are the you know the Bible carriers and creators of um, literally everything there is to know about network effects, right? Like you continue to invest and specialize in this, so. You've, it feels like it's very current knowledge and you've effectively laid out with your yeah. physics background, right? Like really foundational first principles of what it is, decomposed it. Tell us a little bit about this and what does it mean for a startup today? Is, yeah. you know, that like the figuring that network is like uh, component out and how important, when is it important to figure out, right? Does it force you to get the basic functionality and the user experience, and then you go on the network effects, or do you really need the network effects right away? Because I think yeah. one of the things that I ran into challenges like, hey, this is really exciting, creates a lot of value, no brainer. But do you go build network effects at the very beginning, or do you first solve a particular problem for a particular user and then add that network effects kind of uh, as an additional momentum and defensive uh, capability? Or do you start with network effects first? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, just I think folks listening should be kind of pretty familiar with network effects, but it's the principle where the product or service gets better the more people use that product or service. Um, gets better for all users the more mm -hmm. people use it. And so I think this is really born out of my personal experience and similar experiences from um, the other partners that, you know, Last Minocom on a travel marketplace, truly a Zillow on a real estate marketplace. And it's like they appear pretty fragile when you're building them. But once you get to a certain scale, it becomes like remarkable that the kind of like product has a life of its own, it's incredibly defensible. And you know, through the analysis that we've done, the vast majority of value creation um, through the internet era has come from companies that have network effects at their core, you know. You know, think in the last sort of 20 plus years, it's very obvious, you know, that the big ones, particularly Facebook, uh, Airbnb, Uber are just like classic, classic deep network effect businesses. And that's our. Well, I would even go, I would like say, hey, like, let's take a look at Microsoft Office Suite, right? Yeah. That was fundamentally network effects business because once you have a few people that figure out how to use it then they can share content uh and yeah. then other people to leverage the slides and then obviously app uh ecosystem around windows or apple right so it's, it was even true before the intranet i would argue right but oh, it certainly yeah. was intranet it just put this on steroids i um, mean it's only true you go back to the kind of like classical marketplaces and look at you can go back in history and you go to someone like you know, um, Venice or cities and like they're marketplace towns. And yeah. so these that's a network effect that sort of yeah. like trade aggregates buyers and sellers in that marketplace. And so it's it's almost like we think of it really like as law of nature. I mean it's a, it's an economic um principle, but it sort of pervades it's pervasive not just in um um you know in sort of like classical social networks or consumer marketplaces, but really a lot of like B2B and, you know, we've seen bio companies that were investing in crypto have kind of massive network effects. You know, the AI, there would be network effects in AI as that kind of, that matures as well. And so, and so we we think of it as just a guiding principle. It's, you know, NFX will last, um, you know, uh, many, many decades, we anticipate. And so 
Um, and so having that as kind of a, a guiding principle is is um, is really important for us. And so and that and that transcends categories. We don't we don't think about this as some sort of specific specific category. So that that's the focus in terms of like what we you know is this you know we certainly invest in companies that are um, very obvious network effects from the outset, um, but we also invest in companies that like. You know, it could be a, a sort of straightforward SaaS tool that solves a meaningful problem. But the, you know, the founders know, okay, as soon as this gets any scale, it's going to get like 20 competitors that have come in and they'll be able to kind of like copy this kind of functionality. Maybe not all of it, but kind of like a bunch of it. And so it's really critical that the kind of next phase of growth is that we need to build these um, defensible mode and defensibilities. Effect. Yeah. around it you know and that and that is you know network effects are digitally native um they're very scalable once in place and so if they can take this early early head start for this tool then we can add that network effect on board whether it's a platform whether it's a marketplace whether it's multiple network effects um in there and that that really is the path to help to create okay well, yes we're creating economic value for our participants but we're also creating defensibility and enduring companies. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is, is invest in really enduring companies that, you know, that become the kind of winner take most or, or category defining businesses of their vertical. So let's like you brought up B2B. So let's just for the argument's sake, because people probably imagine network effects in consumer oriented businesses, but not as much in B2B let's like any examples that come to mind of you know well-known yeah. b2b businesses that rely on various types of network effects right and we talked a little bit about um learning how to use presentation design software right like you could you know maybe there are other examples that are more recent that you want to yeah. highlight i mean that there's i think there's the sort of the, the playbook that we've seen certainly for kind of for successful B2B businesses has been like, yes, let's have a compelling product. Mm -hmm. um, and then building some sort of, you know, there's probably two parts. One is a, a platform um, out of it. So you build the product, become the platform. So Salesforce um, with its app store and, and an ecosystem around that is very clear. You've seen Zoom do a kind of similar path with mixed success, but it's um, thank, thank you for promoting. We love App Exchange, one of our favorite customers that relate to and yeah. early believers. And it is remarkable, you know, what a what a community it is. And it was it was you're right, very much a pioneer in the web based B two B community that was not a thing. Yeah, uh, when right like when they started shortly after the IPO or around the IPO. So uh, great, great point. And and then you see the other, you know, the other, and you see Notion do kind of. Yeah. not similar but kind of um you know building that kind of network effect into their into the product and then you see you know the other the other path often is okay how do you how do you build into the kind of network of participants outside of this um of this platform it's been you know carter is a sort of a classic example mm -hmm. around, around this the network effects of of um of carter they kind of there's core network effects from an ease of use perspective and a database of record in that business. And then they ventured into this sort of um, um, uh, secondary marketplace to offer liquidity on uh, private transactions. And that and that somewhat competed with their core business. And, and that obviously in retrospect wasn't a great idea um, for them to do, but there's many other areas where it is a good idea. So we've seen, you know, we've backed uh, companies that have really compelling uh, tools and then add in a kind of marketplace for procurement. So how can they purchase products at cheaper price more efficiently? And that's that's a clear network effect there. So fundamentally the insight is that it it's sort of it's A, it's a sequencing game and B, there could be multiple types of network effects from Absolutely. core to periphery. So it's not like, oh, I got a network effect. Good. My job is done. It's like it's just like was a product iterations you kind of continue to build additional defensive moats yeah. and I capabilities. Think, yeah, and I think particularly in this sort of new AI era, 
Mm. I think there's um, it's going to be very interesting. There's going to be a bunch of different kind of network effects built out of that area. Um, but we do see a lot of the sort of magical tools that are being kind of built out to solve specific problems, whether it's their kind of presentation tools, other tools um, that can really be game changed. But, but then founders are really, okay, how do we add the marketplace or network effect defensibility on top of that? Because there are so many other competitors going after similar problems um, using AI. Um, but what is our ultimate defensibility going to be? Right. So the question is the the whatever is the latest technology, underlying technology like AI, the fundamentals of of capturing, you know, some kind of creating value for customers, capturing that value and then defending that value, that that still needs to be played out. And that's whether it's it's sort of network effects is one of those games, right? A classical SaaS or whatever other playbook is another game. But yeah. you need to, just because you have AI doesn't solve all problems, right? You still need to think that through. So what are you seeing? Like, what are people, who who is really getting a combo of AI and network effects right right now? Or is it too early to tell? Yeah. Well, I think it's it's really early. I, I would say it's very early on. I, I, we generally look at AI as a spectrum. So right. there's sort of, you know, there's one end of the spectrum, which is, you know, and it, really using kind of AI in a somewhat invisible way. Like, okay, I write my, I do my customer service more efficiently. I write my code more efficiently, but kind of like, you know, I think all companies in AI in some respect in the area. And then the other end of the spectrum is, um, you know, AI first businesses that are really kind of like native to solve a breakthrough product or service that otherwise couldn't be done um, in the area. And, and and we're very much kind of like swinging into that direction, obviously, from a kind of a investment perspective, because we think we can build, you know, breakthrough businesses in in that in that arena. Um, I would say there's, you know, there's probably a couple of different sort of AI and network effect areas which are intriguing. One is one is really the looking at the assets or technologies within AI and and building you know, marketplaces or networks around them. And I don't know exactly what that will look like, um, but you can see whether that's, um, and, and some of these emerging ideas around this area are kind of like, the, there's clearly startups in that space. So Hugging Face is doing that for models and, um, and algorithms. Um, there's GPU marketplaces out there, which are kind of like, this is the sort of, you know, the, the scarce commodity, which um, how do you build? capabilities around that, you know, unclear the defensibility exactly, but it seems seems intriguing. And there'll be other areas, whether that's marketplaces around um, AI created assets, mm -hmm. um, you know, from avatars to kind of other um, components. And so that will be, you know, these are kind of like the, the tradable assets are purely um, uh, kind of AI native themselves. And so the new marketplace opportunities will be created out of that. And that's sort of, that's that's definitely intriguing area. And we'll see where that goes. Could also be, uh, you know, um, algorithm to algorithm or AI to AI in mm -hmm. terms of communication, just like you'll have in any sort of business transaction of lawyers and bankers and, and business people working together. Yeah. You could see these sort of AIs doing those things, whether that's complex procurement, project management, other areas within that's that's an intriguing area. And then there's probably more mundane stuff, which is, okay, how do I create what is a breakthrough tool to help in, you know, it could be legal, it could be construction, it could be an education. And then what is the marketplace built on top of that? And there'll be a, and I think these, you know, I I think people are kind of this. And as more and more people start to use some of these AI tools, they're going to be expecting high levels of intelligence from our product experiences. And I don't know exactly what that will look like, but just like, you know, you, you, your, your expectation, just like when you go into Google and you type a query, you know, like it's in the top few answers is going to be a, the answer to your question, or you think you do. Um, with, with chat GPT, you're going to, you know, you type a prompt in and you feel, Okay, it's going to give me the sort of intelligence of a 
I don't know, a kind of like a my intern or like a you know someone who's pretty good, um, competent, but maybe not um, the world expert on it. And you're going to expect this experience across all product, um, um, all internet products. So you think the bar will start getting higher? Absolutely. Right? I and mean, so it's, this, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean that's just the nature of things, and so. It's going to be a bunch of this stuff, which is table stakes, and there's going to be a bunch of founders will use this to reinvent different product experiences. So, so let, this this actually takes us to the very beginning, right? To your first pitch that you were saying, where you showed up in the front, you you know, front end UX UI was not necessarily up to par, right? Uh, for investors, and then you kind of went, you know, and fixed that kind of that level of experience. At least the 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 consumer facing component, and if we look, you know, I, I kind of look at it from my perspective, like back in you know uh, ninety in ninety seven when I first encountered Microsoft Office when I worked there, and the PDFs and the documents they kind of they haven't really changed that much, you know, from that era. Much less, you know, even if you're in Silicon Valley, you're still sending around like relatively you know, old fashioned, sometimes pre-internet formats. And so we look at that and, you know, I, I, I'm wondering, like, what do you think is preventing some industries leaping into this new world and they're still stuck in the old UX, UI? And then, you know, we're parallel, uh, in parallel time, we're having as consumers, right? In the consumer-led, you know, consumer-led marketplaces, you know, the experience is much more wrapping around us and it's anticipating everything we need as a consumer. So what's your take on, you know, why do you think some areas just get stuck a little bit in the old way of doing things? And does that create opportunities? Is it, oh, it creates, uh, yeah, it creates significant opportunities. I think, I mean, there's, you know, there's, we've seen big elements of our lives being transformed um, through technology and, and the internet. And I think there are many other, elements that are not and they all have their sort of different reasons often it comes down to like lack of incentive mm. um to some sometimes it's regulation um but often i think it's like it's just no incentive um when you look inertia at inertia and no incentive is a combo yeah i mean like you know no incentive for the company um or no incentive for the individual mm -hmm. um to do things um they just they don't really have that kind of incentive and it may not even, you know, there may not be a profit pool there for, um, for kind of like startups to invest in it and attack. But I do think that this is like, you know, there's, it's like the San Andreas fault. It's like, you kind of see kind of people using, you know, whether it's um, government software or kind of other sort of legacy kind of, that they're, you know, on the one hand, the, the things they use in their private life are getting, getting better and better and better right. here. And they're kind of the stuff they use in the professional life is stuck in the dark ages. And it's just like the pressure's building up just like the San Andreas fault. And one day it's going to like flip. Um, and I do think this AI opportunity kind of gives this opportunity for leapfrogging. Because I think so the, the, the AI way, is going to be the enabler to make this sort of 100x better, 1000x better. That I think, just makes the status quo no, no longer sustainable. I think it, it can do. I think it can do. I think for a couple of reasons. One is just the product experience don't just become a little bit better. Um, they become radically better. Um, and I think it's like, whoa, this is so um, um, this is so good. It's like, I can't ignore this. Um, it's not just a sort of like, you know, um, you know, cloud-based software versus sort of on-prem or something. It's like this, or just like, okay, this is it's not just built in a modern, easy, easy to use way. It's like, it just becomes radically better. And that's just enough of a kind of capitalist. Then the other, the other piece is that you just, I think this is a, you know, literally, you know, overnight, I think AI is part of the conversation in every boardroom. Every right. CIO and every CEO has been asked, what is their AI strategy? Um, and so the sort of corporate kind of um enthusiasm is for this is technology to them. is off the charts um um and so it's like if you're pitching a kind of you know some sort of breakthrough technology and, and the ai can be you know can be proprietary or you can just be using something off the shelf um but it's like 
the the sort of like customer interest in the technology is um is significant and so those you know i think those two combined mean that the kind of markets you know there are certain markets that are sort of well established and improving with ai and there are other markets which are like okay this is going to be the you know the the iphone moment for them that they'll start right. to these businesses on you know online in a modern way well this is this is a great way to summarize this discussion for me it's for the for the audience that listening i think this is a great insight and in like whether you're a cio or cmo to hear your perspective pete on what kind of what they should be paying attention to and uh, for um for, for us as general consumers i want to thank you for creating a radically better online real estate technology for creating radically better venture uh, venture firm models for pre-seed and seed uh, seed investment that creates a ton of tools and value for the ecosystem and creating a radically better podcast experience sharing all these insights today with us thank you so much for uh, for being here Pete how can people find you and NFX yeah so we're um we're pretty visible so nfx.com is a website um sign up for the email newsletter there's a ton of like great kind of insights and articles about company building starting companies scaling them um and then uh twitter uh, or x um at pete flint amazing thank you so much pete great, great to see you alex